Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Masaro Method. Now, this is a very exciting day. I am welcoming my good friend Alexander Sherba, who is an ambassador at large at the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry. He's held a number of different posts around the world and with very consultant to various different companies and all sorts of with the private sector, with the public sector, with Ukraine. He's an author. He's written a book called uh, Ukraine versus Darkness. Uh, and we are meeting today on a historic day. I mean, a truly historic day following the visit of President Biden to Kiev. So this is, I mean, this is bigger than even just the the moment that is visiting during wartime. But indeed, he is the first president to visit Ukraine in 15 years, I believe, since 2008. Is that right, Alexander? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I, it's it's I mean so it's it's extremely exciting so so Alexander I'm I'm really excited to have you today as we take a look at this visit but also in the context of a year of grueling defense against Russian genocide so thank you for joining thank you for having me Paul it it is indeed a very very exciting day uh, just uh, waking up today uh, and seeing the whole uh, Kiev downtown block for traffic. And guessing who is coming because uh, <laughs> nobody, uh, we, we had all kinds of high ranking guests, but this kind of uh, high level security, it was unseen in the last uh, year at least. And then to discover that Joe Biden is the most courageous president in, in America's newest history, it was pleasant and it was great. Uh, I mean, I, I, I woke up this morning. I had my phone was just endless messages from Ukrainian friends that were like, oh, oh my God, dude, you got you got to look at the news. Stuff like that. What's happened? You know, <laughs> like, I, I take a look and it's just, oh, my God, I was so proud. I mean, it, it just enormous pride in 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 President Biden, who I think is has here really. I mean, I, I have been, um, you know, I think fairly critical at times of the of the pace. And I think a lot of. Uh, members of Congress have been and so on and so forth, the pace of weapons and the pace of support for Ukraine. But obviously this is this is just nothing short of extraordinary. You know, I mean, it's to, especially to visit during wartime. So so let's get into this. I, 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 I want to say first, as always, please share, comment, like, subscribe, you know, get these videos seen and keep the channel growing. So, Alexander, I think the the big question following this visit is what does it mean? You know, and 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 put it put it into context for us. After a year of war, so so on Friday, that'll be the anniversary of Russia's genocidal full scale invasion. Of course, the war, Russia's invasion, started in 2014, but this is since the full scale invasion uh, that would have started a year ago on February 24th. So, what does it mean to Ukrainians? What does it mean to the world? What does it mean to Americans? How should we understand the president going to Ukraine today? Well, it's a huge uh, signal of support, a signal of uh, uh, the fact that America uh, is uh, the leader of the free world, that the free world is still a thing. Quite frankly, for me personally, uh, for someone who was involved with Ukrainian-American relations for quite a while, it's a change of pace, uh, not only during this war, but generally uh, in Ukrainian-American relations, because American presidents uh, were uh, rather reluctant to visit Ukraine in general. They visited Ukraine usually like some people visit uh, dentists, you know, when it, <laughs> could, it couldn't be postponed. Uh, President Clinton <laughs> visited, visited Ukraine in the last months of his presidency, uh, President uh, W. George W. Bush in the last months of his presidency of his second term, uh, Obama never visited Ukraine. Trump, of course, never visited Ukraine. Uh, so now uh, everything is changing. Uh, uh, finally, America is recognizing and seeing the value of Ukraine and the miracle of Ukraine because Ukraine is uh, the place. Well, well, first of all, it's. Uh, 
using the term coined by uh, John McCain, it's, uh, it's uh, not just uh, a territory, it's an idea worth fighting for. Uh, yes. And uh, Ukraine is the place that basically reinvented freedom, democracy on her own, um, despite uh, thick layers of bad history, bad uh, historic karma, whatever, you know. And, uh, and this is the value of Ukraine, because uh, mm, nobody really believed in Ukraine uh, 30 years ago when we became independent. But most importantly, a year ago, uh, nobody gave us a chance to, you know, to uh, stand against this second uh, uh, largest, biggest army of the world. And nevertheless, here we are. I mean, it's it's nothing short of extraordinary. And I have argued before very publicly that Ukraine saved the world, you know, in, in its defense of Kyiv essentially prevented a, a world war because obviously Russia was not going to stop at Kiev. They had every intention of going after Moldova and then eventually testing NATO as well, possibly allowing for a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. I certainly believe that she and Putin had an agreement there. But but what you're pointing out, and I think what I'm seeing this morning and why I'm so euphoric is it's actually even beyond that. It's 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 also that Ukraine has now burst onto the world stage as this emblem, as as this demonstration of the idea of freedom in a new age when it kind of f- felt a little worn out. You know, it felt a little bit like, oh, man, like, especially in the aftermath of Iraq and Afghanistan, sort of what does it mean to fight for freedom? What does it mean to and 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 Ukraine has really demonstrated that. And and I, I think you're absolutely right. That's what I see in this visit is Biden essentially, you know, I, I don't know, putting putting the marker down that Ukraine is the country fighting for freedom. It is the emblem of freedom. It is the rallying cry for a new generation of freedom fighters, not only Ukrainian. Obviously, I got into politics because I believe in American values. And I have been so disappointed um, in my own life to see the kind of, you know, wishy-washy way that these values have been approached. But in Ukraine, you absolutely find them. I and mean, Ukraine makes me feel more American, you know? And I think that's that when I when you see that today, it's just, I mean, it's just amazing. I, I want to ask you, like, there is, this is a time when, you know, Ukraine is, facing down one of the hardest parts of the war. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, like Russia is sending in hundreds of thousands more untrained Mobics who, I mean, they're they're dangerous simply by their numbers. They're not, you know, I mean, and, and it's hard mentally to have to kill so many invaders even, you know, um, is this is this visit going to reignite the Ukrainian spirit and well, not really reignite, but help to bolster the Ukrainian spirit at a time when um, when they're facing down this hardship? Absolutely. It's uh, this war is all about spirit is uh, it's, of course, about the ammo is, of course, about, you know, the uh, readiness to fight. But uh, you're ready to fight because uh, because your spirit is strong. And um, that this is what 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 uh, uh, changed uh, profoundly the uh, course of this war. I mean, remember, let's let let's remember, uh, for, let's think back to uh, February twenty fourth. Uh, nobody gave Ukraine a chance. Uh, we were at uh, zero point expectations. Uh, our president, uh, uh, our foreign minister. Um, Kuleba uh, uh, told in one one of the interviews about his uh, conversation back then with the President Obama, uh, with President Biden, and he he said that President Biden was speaking well. First of all, you are father, you are a husband, you you should be thinking about your family, and it will be a difficult time. And uh, uh, Minister Kuleba says, actually, it felt as if uh, everybody was uh, bidding goodbye to us. Uh, and uh, 
this it was the spirit of ukraine spirit of ukrainians the readiness to fight and the um unreadiness of ukrainian civilians to to fight amongst each other so that was the first moment when the nation went so consolidated that changed everything so yes the spirit is very very important uh, in this war and to president biden coming to basically a war zone having the guts is just something very very important uh, yeah I mean, and, and, and you're so right about the spirit and you're also so right about our um, skepticism toward toward Ukraine. And I mean, I, I, I think the entire free world should be at least a little humbled, you know, by by the skepticism toward Ukraine. I think the experts on the region should be a little humbled. I think at this point we should all be ready to learn and listen yeah. To Ukrainians. Military experts, uh, uh, yeah. Russia experts. I mean, the list is endless. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is it is essentially one of these historic moments where we just got it completely wrong. I mean, I mean, just com- completely wrong in, in every way. And thank God we did. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I mean, you're, you're right about President Zelensky again in this in this notion of. I mean, we were ready to evacuate him. I mean, our, our our advice to him was leave. I mean, we were we were ready to lose, and the Ukrainians like had to slap us into shape and be like, "Come on, guys." Um. So, I mean, we're now we're now a year out from that historic moment. We're a year out from President Zelensky's famous words: "I I don't need a ride. I need ammunition." We're a year out from that incredible historic video that played around the world of, you know, the president is here, the prime minister is here, the Ukrainian people are here, you know, and I mean, you know, how have things changed? What has Ukraine learned? What do we need to know going forward uh, in order to achieve Ukrainian victory? Well, first of all, uh, what changed is uh, is this confidence that we have now uh, on the ground here in Ukraine that we are winning this war. It wasn't there uh, a year ago, even when Ukraine started fighting, even when uh, it became obvious that Ukraine will resist this famous hashtag from back from that time. Uh, But uh, this confidence that we are unbreakable and the world is unbreakable It wasn't there uh, a year ago. It is there right now. Uh, Because just take a look uh, at Putin's uh, strategy and tactics. There is nothing he uh, hasn't tried yet. He tried the Blitzkrieg uh, strategy. It didn't work. He tried to to, uh, uh, shell us with endless, you know, uh, salvos of, you know, this uh, uh, ammunition that he had uh, uh, unlimited in the first part of this war and Ukraine didn't and it didn't work. Uh, then uh, he uh, tried to, to freeze us to death during this winter. It didn't work. So um, that's, the, that's the, the feeling on the ground. We are winning. We, we are still not quite clear uh, in the definitions, what this means, winning the war, but uh, the mood is that we are definitely not losing. Okay, let's 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 dig into winning the war just a little bit because I think that that's that's really important. I mean, at this point, there's a at this point now a year in, Ukraine has demonstrated an enormous ability to resist, has also demonstrated an enormous ability to reclaim territory, right? Uh, um. So there are certainly those in the West. I, I you know, I, I think they're they're certainly fewer than pre February twenty fourth, twenty twenty two, but they still exist. Who say uh, Ukraine should seek some sort of negotiated settlement with or or ceasefire with Russia? I mean, so I think setting out the terms of what it means for Ukraine to win is actually is actually pretty important so that those individuals can be silenced. So what what does it mean in your view for Ukraine to win? I mean what are the what are the minimum um terms? 
Uh, well, uh, the big debate in Ukraine is between those who believe that uh, victory is um, uh, restoring Ukraine's uh, sovereignty over the whole territory, including Crimea, and those who think that winning this war means uh, burning down the Kremlin. Uh, well, quite frankly, there are uh, not not few people who believe in that. I have a friend who is in the army. He is basically adamant about this. He says, without breaking uh, Russia, uh, the new war will be around the corner. Uh, I'm uh, not as optimistic as he is, so I think uh, we should be focusing on, uh, you know, reclaiming our territories. That would be a, a blow uh, big enough uh, to Putin. I think that uh, uh, once this war uh, is uh, lost to Putin in the way that I mean, Ukraine has reclaimed its territories, uh, it will be the beginning of the end for Putin. And without Putin, it will be uh, the beginning of the end uh, for the system Putin created. Because uh, it was, it has taken KGB, former KGB, now FSB, two decades to build this, you know, very intimate relationship between so-called deep Russia and the supreme leader. And whoever comes after Putin uh, won't have this rapport uh, with uh, the deep Russia. So uh, it will be, uh, it won't, he won't be as powerful as Putin, especially in decisions like peace and, uh, uh, peace and war. Um, so that's, that's, that's my answer. We should focus on reclaiming our territory. So although the big question is, of course, what do we do with all the brainwashed population, especially in Donbass, especially, well, in Crimea, I think would be strangely enough uh, easier for, our, for us uh, than in uh, Donbass because, because in Donbass, uh, people are, um, people, well, it, it, it just the whole history of, you know, this uh, eight year war uh, is more complicated than uh, the peaceful history or relatively peaceful history of uh, post 2014 Crimea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I think that's I think that's the right. I mean, it, it, as much as I certainly can understand that where <laughs> the the urge among particularly those that who have been fighting um, comes from, it does it does seem right to say that the restoration of 1991 borders, internationally recognized borders needs to be the top condition for Ukrainian victory. Right. And then and then there's a number of other things. I mean, it, for example, one thing that occurs to me is security guarantees. Right. I mean, we need to when it comes to preventing this from happening again, which is absolutely critical, you know, I mean, there will have to be some level of security guarantees for Ukraine. I mean, ideally, those might include Ukraine in NATO, right? I mean, is that is that on the agenda? Well, it's definitely on the agenda and it's definitely the target of Ukraine, although we understand that with members like Erdogan and Orban, uh, yeah. uh, and yeah. with uh, NATO as a, a consensus organization, it will be immensely difficult. Plus, uh, I wouldn't exclude that uh, uh, we, as President Zelensky, uh, a couple of times uh, uh, mentioned uh, there, there can be um, security guarantees that are as powerful and as uh, almost as uh, uh, convincing as uh, NATO membership. So it might be on the table, at least this is my opinion, uh, discussing, choosing between those, those two options. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as to, as to Russia, um, as you say, I mean, I, I, I mean, my view has been that Crimea is absolutely critical there because the, the liberation of Crimea basically undermines the legitimacy of Putin's entire, you know, system that that's his that's his claim, right, to to rule as a wartime leader is um, this ability to, you know, take and occupy Ukrainian territory. And when that when that stops, then then Putin's in a lot of trouble. I mean, are we are we on the brink, in your view, of Russian civil war and you know, I guess also a related question is, obviously, the West has gotten Russia very, very wrong. I mean, I mean, just profoundly wrong over 30 years. I mean, I, I would say since 1991, we have been wrong on Russia. 
I mean, maybe maybe since 93, maybe you could say since che- since uh, Chechnya, since, you know, since essentially we should have been able to recognize in what happened in Grozny, what was going on in, in Russia. Um, and we didn't. We had a bunch of wishful thinking about what Russia could be. And as a security provider for the region and all this crazy fantasy we allowed ourselves to believe and allowed a mil- Russian military buildup to happen. I mean, what is what is the appropriate Western policy toward Russia? What should what should the West How should the West be viewing Russia? Well, first of all, uh, Putin should be a pariah. That's 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 for sure. Yeah, I mean, Putin personally, as the person who made this decision of this war, who carries this responsibility, uh, he should be a target for uh, international uh, court. And there is no question about that. International criminal court. Um, second of all, uh, it should be uh, unquestioned that Russia should pay the reparations for what it has uh, broken in Ukraine. That's uh, clear. Uh, and third of all, uh, of course, there should be some options for the post-Putin uh, era uh, once Russia indicates that it uh, has parted uh, and uh, part of ways with uh, so Putinism, then there should be a way for Russia to somehow re-embark with the international community and uh, to become a full-fledged member. Although, quite frankly, oh, when I look at some uh, European countries who are just so eager uh, to once again forgive uh, uh, Russia almost everything and just to embrace them once again and to, to do all the mistakes once again. I just ask myself whether some of Europeans and some of Americans have really learned anything from this war. Yeah, it's tragic, isn't it? I mean, I, 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 I noticed that as well. And, and, and how and ultimately how little accountability there's been for those who got this so dramatically wrong and and in some cases very much engaged in malpractice. You know, we're, we're writing um, with connections to the Kremlin or with, you know, uh, with, with invitations to Moscow and, 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 and that sort of thing. So, so had, a, had an ulterior motive beyond simply... I mean, there, there were those who I think genuinely got it wrong and then those that sort of had ulterior motives to get it wrong. But, but there were a lot that got Or those wrong. who did both. <laughs> or those who did both. Yeah. That's, well, I mean, that's the, that's the problem is it's actually really hard to tell these people apart. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the tragedy of all of it. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would say they're all there, you know, in some sense, it needs to be deeper than that. Like, I mean, there, there needs to be some level of advocacy to keep Russia isolated. One, one thing I've, heard and have liked is the notion of, you know, Russian denuclearization and demilitarization as a as a precondition to um, reintegration with the international community, um, regardless of, of what happens internal to Russia. Right. I mean, who knows what will happen internally to Russia? That's not really our business. But we do have a decision as to who we trade with and who we do business with. Right. And and we should withhold that for as long as it takes. I mean, in, 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 in my view, because I mean, you just can't, you can't have a country like this in the world. I mean, it's like not, not, not three, four years goes by that Russia isn't threatening somebody with nuclear annihilation or invading one of its neighbors. I mean, it's just that, that kind of a state is an enormous spoiler, you know? But, but, uh, do you see the strengths in the world, uh, to follow through with this, uh, line of action because uh, my feeling is uh, that the world is just eager for uh, this war to be over one way or another uh, and uh, not the world in general but many many people and even countries uh, uh, and just to uh, start uh, heading back to business as usual and uh, for Russia to get uh, uh, denuclearized and demilitarized, it would uh, take a great amount of, you know, moral conviction uh, of the strengths. And I don't see that in uh, today's West, quite frankly. Do you? Do you? Uh, 
yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I actually see it more now a year later than I did immediately after the invasion. I think that, I mean, you know, even I have transformed pretty significantly over the last year. And I was pretty good, as you know, prior to prior to February 24th. Um, I mean, but I mean, I was still one of like the 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 more hawkish on Russia. But, I, but since then, I've become you know, even more hawkish, you know, and I, and I think that I think you see, a, uh, you know, in one sense, people people claim, you know, there's time is not on Ukraine's side or something like this, you know, and we need to win this war rapidly. And I agree. I agree. The war needs to be won rapidly because I'm worried about Ukraine because I because I I'm worried about the people that are dying in Ukraine. Ukraine is losing a greatest generation of creative, smart, you know, dynamic young people. And, and, and that can't be allowed to happen. That said, I mean, I actually think that the longer this goes on, the more Western attitudes have hardened, in fact. I mean, one looks at Schultz, right? A guy who, prior to February 2022, seemed just completely in Putin's pocket. You know, I mean, I mean, a guy who just total overtures to Russia every single day, it felt like. And yet now uh, has almost completely come around onto the onto the side of Ukraine now under enormous pressure, of course, but pressure is all part of this, right? I mean, so in one sense, I think that like the the Ukrainian narrative coming to the fore after basically 30, maybe even 300 years of of being brushed under the rug has changed things. It continues to change things really significantly. I even think about like the global the global south, as they say, which has been largely um, still Russia friendly under this Soviet era notion of the Soviet Union as some kind of decolonial power and their decolonial countries and those colonial imperialists in the West. I mean, the more the Ukrainian story is told, which this is Russia's colonial war against Ukraine, which you, it views Ukraine as a colony of its, you know, I mean, the more the global South will come around as well. So, I mean, it's I think that the Ukrainian story is actually even more powerful than anyone has realized, both in the freedom sense, which, of course, appeals to somebody like me, but also in the the very serious decolonial sense of like the Ukrainians are struggling for their independence against a European empire. You know, I mean, this is this is tale as old as time. Absolutely. It's the most uh, imperial war uh, of our news history. Uh, a former uh, dominion is dragging uh, a former colony uh, back into its shadow uh, and uh, it's just stunning for me so how many uh, African nations, how many uh, people in Latin America in, in Asia misunderstand that, take it, see it wrong, don't see the fact that it's just like uh, uh, you know, if uh, uh, the United Kingdom all of a sudden went insane and was trying to uh, uh, get uh, India back uh, into, uh, you know, British Empire. <laughs> that is exactly what this is. That that's the that is that is that is the big misconception is like, I mean, it's it's because the, the West has a particular way of viewing decolonization, which largely views itself at fault and and, and and because of Russian disinformation, which has tried to, to frame Russia. I mean, you know, like 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 Putin even claiming the Russian Federation is somehow anti-colonial, even as it literally has colonies within its borders. I mean, I mean, you know, it's 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 like I, I had a I had a Venezuelan friend, Armando Armas, on this show um, last week. And he was talking about how RT is among the most viewed programs in Latin America, you know? So, I mean, I mean, yes. So, I mean, I, I just like Russian disinformation because because essentially you, you still have this legacy of a lot of this global south looking for narratives that frame the USA and Western Europe as like bad actors and so on and so forth. And, and it, kind of the confirmation bias problem at the heart of any good propaganda and Russia is a very good at propaganda, right? Um, you know, there, there's this, there's this temptation always to, you know, be like, okay, whatever is against the West must necessarily be good. But, but I mean, I really urge these individuals to take a step back and try to view this 
from the Ukrainian perspective, um, which is very much one of decolonization and the fight for independence against a colonial empire, which I mean, it's 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 just impossible not to see Russia as a colonial empire once you're once you're looking at it kind of and objectively. They're saying it proudly. They are saying colonial yes. empire. It's not like uh, people people uh, in I don't know in the West uh, are ashamed about their imperial legacy. They are heartbroken about the many many terrible things that have were done. Russians are thrilled, enthused. They are absolutely uh, insane about you know you know being an empire again, and. Uh, uh, they're saying what a good thing it is for, for, for to, to be colonized by a wonderful, beautiful, uh, uh, white-skinned uh, 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 empire, you know. And it's just people are just saying this out loud, proudly. And 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 the whole, uh, as you say, global south just doesn't hear it. They just hear, and they, all they see is just this courageous uh, Putin uh, challenging the uh, if unjust, unfair uh, global order, which is completely not, not what it is. It's a global fascist putsch that Putin is uh, conducting against uh, the global order. You're absolutely correct. And, and I guess what I, what, I mean, my hopeful remark here, I guess, to, to, to end the conversation is just to say it took Schultz a year, okay? It took Schultz a whole year. The Germans, who are literally your neighbors, right? I mean, it, it took them a year to finally say, OK, we're all in with Ukraine. You know, I mean, it's so so I mean, Russia's propaganda, Russia's disinformation has rotted minds. I mean, it is it is they are they are so good at flooding the zone with their trash. It rots minds. It gets into your head. But people are recognizing the truth because the truth in the Ukrainian case is just irresistible. It's irresistible long term. I mean, you can't when you when you finally start to really look closely at Ukraine and, and Biden in Ukraine and all this kind of stuff, you really see like, holy crap, like this is the real deal. This is the truth. This is this is the highest aspiration of the human condition, you know, and this is this is something that we should really get behind. So I actually think I think there's going to be more and more and more and more support for Ukraine. I think there's a reason that it hasn't worn down. I actually think over time, more Russian propaganda will be wiped away, fewer minds will be rotted, and you know we're gonna we're gonna be able to see this much more clearly. The the weak point of Russian propaganda, like of every tyranny, is that it's it's very good at appealing to the worst in human nature, like to 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 the fears, to the greed, uh, to the egoism. Uh, but it's absolutely helpless when it deals with the heroic uh, side uh, of human nature, with what Ukraine showed in this war. This was absolutely, this left them speechless that uh, not everybody in the world, especially not those uh, hillbillies in Ukraine, because they do see us as hillbillies and yes. unworthy and, uh, you know, inferior in every way to this great empire, that these uh, people are uh, capable of this self-sacrifice, of this heroism, of this bravery, of, uh, you know, you know, of this love, quite frankly, because this war is also about this endless love to your country, endless love to your freedom. And this is the point where Putin is helpless, because he knows three things. He knows how to bribe people, he knows how to intimidate people, he knows how to fool people. He didn't learn anything else at the KGB school. Uh, and this makes me hopeful. Yes, and it should. That's a, that's a great hopeful note to end on. Alexander, thank you so much for joining. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And Slava Ukraina! Bye-bye. Bye-bye.